certain irony for me today. I spent my entire life telling people to think outside the box, and I'm stuck in a circle. I want to take you on a journey of where education is going. The really interesting thing is whenever I talk about education, the first thing is people imagine their children, or their nephews or their nieces. They don't think about themselves. And this is fundamentally holding back an entire generation of professionals, people who have done the same job for a long time and are harnessing what they learned from the past, imagining it's going to prepare them for the road ahead. This idea of an ambush, I hear time and time again, people saying that technology is happening to them, as though it's something destructive that's coming in to test them, to actually come in and make their life more difficult. Nothing could be further from the truth. Technology has given this world the abundance. It's democratized sec entire sectors. It's changed the way you think of health. It's things, well, things like longevity has completely changed, we'll be living longer, we'll be more healthy and far more educated. It's not an ambush, but a time of opportunity. This is one of the stats that completely floor people. We sit in a Western country, and we imagine, from what we hear in the media, that the population is old. We're closer to retirement than we are to school age. Nothing could be further from the truth. Because what we need to do is take ourselves from our micro-environment to the macro world. Take a wide-angle view across the growing markets. And if you, like me, were born in a time of a Generation X, you grew up when the world population was half of what it is today. So in just one lifetime, the population has already doubled, and by the time I leave this planet, it will have tripled. And so what we've seen in the last few generations is prosperity and wealth and longevity popping up in places like Africa, South America, the Middle East. And what that's meant is the actual effect is we've diluted and diluted the age group until we're down to the point where just 15% of the entire population are over 55 years of age. But who's making the decisions? Who's informing our students? Who's making the calls in our companies? Who are on the board of directors? Because actually what we need to understand by the shift is actually the confidence around digital with youth is dominating every part of our world. So let's just put it differently. Half of this world of nearly eight billion people are now under the age of 30. Now, you may not be in that age group, but if you know anyone 30 and younger, you'll understand there is a more high confidence level of the way technology is impacting their lives and how it's changing the business structures that we have, our practices, the way we communicate. We're moving into an open structures, open data, open information. And so this generation are driving change by the masses. Their rules are different. They are ambitious in a different way. Fairness, equity, equality, the environment. They are driven by different levers. They want to participate in different ways. And what we need to think about is in education, how do we make sure we're preparing an entire generation for a much more flexible world? This may not be the world that you're familiar with, but you'll be seeing it inside your organizations people testing you about your values, asking about the purpose of the organization, and wanting very flexible ways of working. The biggest shift we're going to face is this idea of a single shot of education. This concept that you can live, be born, first 25 years of your life, pack it full of education, and use that information to run for the rest of your life. It's completely moved on from that. A child born in Australia in 2007, 50% of them are expected to live to be 104. Now, we're getting older and older and living longer. We're tiring later. And in that process, we are all going to have to shift 
and learn to be part of the new world. The responsibility cannot be passed to the IT team. It cannot be passed to the younger generation. It is on us to get ahead and to be able to fully be able to decipher the new world. So education should look more like this. The white blocks the way we had it, with the view we might live to be 75. But today, we need to be thinking about this lifelong journey of constant reinvestment in knowledge. That might be through sabbaticals, joining clubs, doing a four-day week and a day working in a startup. It might be doing online learning. But we all have to be part of this new world. Let's take a look about the changes in the demographics in the workplace. As of last year, Australia's workforce, 50% of them are now millennials. And these millennials are not choosing to work in large corporations the way they once did. They are choosing different pathways, far more entrepreneurial, contractors, freelancers, people who are choosing different ways of working. And they are coming into your organizations and leading them. So if you look across the world now, 59% of all people who are shaping industry, the people who are shaping our professions, are aged under 35 years. Now, what does this mean for education? What does it mean for that 12-year-old in the school system who currently has been taught subjects, knowledge that I can find on Google, information, the perfect, most up-to-date information right now, not stored in an encyclopedia, being able to apply it at the moment. What we need to think about is developing the child and not their knowledge set. Because if you look at this new work workforce who we're preparing and the one be behind it, the Generation Z, who are up to the age of 19, they don't want ownership. They want access. What they don't want is locked offices and corner offices, they want transparency of information. They want to collaborate with the partners down the road, they want to work across multiple companies, they want to be able to work in the senior teams and in the projects, they want to work in scrums and be agile. The shift is fundamentally happening as we speak. Open talent is not a phenomenon. It is happening all over the world. The idea that you have full-time employees, nine to five, who want to work for you for many years has already disappeared. The time people spend in an organization is shrinking, and flexible work is now becoming the norm. So when we look at that a bit closer, what we see is in the States is a great example where 50% of freelancers, not employees, by choice, this is the gig economy. They may work a couple of days in the week, organization A, a couple of days a week in organization B, and on Fridays, perhaps, they work for a cause that means a lot to them. They're looking at the ability to produce rather than have hours. The productivity and the contribution is based about what they know and can do, not just about how many hours they sit behind the desk. And this is now the norm. So we have to allow our school systems, our universities, and our environments where we work, where we also need to have our employees con contributing to professional development, thinking about this new workforce. A job description has no place today. How can we possibly imagine we're going to bring somebody in for a single job with a single focus and keep them in that job until they decide to move on. What we need to think about is the skills the individual brings. What talents do they have? What connections and networks? What skills do they bring? How do you package that so it means value to your organization because you're bringing the best out of them? But also, how do you package that so that they can also continue to grow and develop? Because I, one of the biggest barriers I hear from employers is what if I invest in my staff member and they leave? What about the flip? What if you don't invest and they stay? <laughs> Let's think about this idea 
The value we get from people is in the here and now what they can do on any given project. What can they can find to make it more efficient? How can they bring technology together? How can they find the right people? It's not about a job description. And to reiterate the point, these younger workers have figured it out. A salary that starts at the bottom of the pecking order in a hierarchical traditional business, compared to project management freelancing in the gig economy and charging out on a project fee. Where there is no hierarchy, they're there for their expertise, they can aim for the top and be part of the decision making from day one. And so the flip of people evaluating tradition against contemporary ways of working. So if you look across the world, businesses have responded. Two-thirds of organizations globally now offer flexible working arrangements. Two-thirds, that includes every country across the world. This Deloitte report was saying that means flexible time, flexible roles, flexible recruitment, and flexible location. Now, if that's not an indicator that we're not training young people for a pathway that takes them to a job for life. We have to look at these insights, these indicators, and truly, truly understand what is driving this huge new population of young people. This certainly was not the type of images I saw as a young person entering my first jobs. The idea of flexibility, creativity, innovation, and fairness, the companies that are attracting young people now look more like this than in the boardroom with a bunch of people in suits. This idea they want to be involved with something that has a rich culture of people where they can bring their whole self to work. And we also need to think about that within our education system. Are we bringing the flexibility? Are we allowing them to think outside the square? Are we really enabling them to think about education that doesn't fit in a one-size-fits-all model? So let's just go back to education. Technology is changing so much. We just heard from Karen about artificial intelligence. These things are happening today. Algorithms making decisions better informed, making better judgment calls than traditional individuals could. Perfect information. Lawyers that can use discovery across every known legal case to make a judgment call through one quick algorithm or medical doctors who can do exactly the same thing with diagnostics. Whether you're a mechanic trying to figure out what's happening to your car, or you're a personal trainer who wants to work out the best routine or diet for a, for a client, AI is reshaping the way we think about knowledge. So we have to think about what are we telling our children? What advice are we giving them? because those industrial education models have had their day. We already know that right now, the model is moving away from fixed knowledge. And actually, we have more job vacancies globally than we've ever had that cannot be filled because employers are looking for people with different types of skill sets that really, truly reflect technology, communication, collaboration, innovation, the ability to think differently and not be cookie-cutter clones of someone coming from the same program. Here's a great example. This was last week in one of my labs in Auckland. So this is an AI teacher, a cognitive teacher who's actually seeing the students and instructing them. This one was developed by a power company to talk about energy. And so it looks like this start with. Geothermal genius. Magma from the Earth's core comes closer to the surface and we end up with volcanoes, hot springs and geysers. But do you know what magma is? Molten rock from the outer core. Absolutely right. I thought Will was really like fantastic. Like he's there looking at us. Like it's like a real human. Here's a quick question for you. What do you think is the windiest city in the world? Wellington. Nice. If the sun is so far away, how long do you think it takes sunlight to reach us? 
10 minutes. Correct. You're a solar superstar. I was curious if they liked me. It's different from like talking to Will than talking to like Siri, for example, because like he's there, you can, you can see him. He was quite human-like, even though he's an AI. What I love about that is the, the young boy comparing Will to Siri, not Will to a teacher. <laughs> now, this is the and and world we live in. This is not going to replace teachers or parents or psychologists. What it means is we can augment and add to the experience. So you have children who are advanced. They know more about energy. They can self-form groups in the classroom and they could go off and have an AI teacher interaction, solve problems separate from perhaps others who need more time in the classroom. We have to think about this and and world. It's not about dropping the past and just picking up the future. The augmentation of bringing technology into our world is part of the key focus going ahead. I want to show another one. So this is uh, Google Cloud, and they're looking at natural language processing. All I did here was simply write a line, a text to speak, and I could go in and choose any dialect, any language, which state, which part of America would you like? Male, female, young, old. So I typed it in, and simply as this, we can go from text to voice. Hi there. It is great to be here at WIDE for Wonder presenting to you. So the advances now that we're seeing, we could only imagine two or three years ago. Computer processing is doubling every year exponentially, and we're seeing the changes that we just couldn't fathom. So a lot of these technologies have been around for an awfully long time, whether it be AI or VR or 3D printing. Most of these technologies are more than 20 years old. But the processing speed is now caught up, and we can run these programs from our pocket because we have a computer in the form of a phone. And so the feel of ambush is not going to go away because it's going to get faster. What we have to understand is your role is about how quickly you can you learn new skills, because the gap between where you are today and where you need to be will only increase. It's not about saying, well, I'll wait till retirement, or I'll wait for the next job, or if I lose my job now, I'll just go and work for a competitor down the road, because they, too, are changing the types of skills they're looking for. The other thing is, with our longevity, the idea of retiring and then switching off from our children, our grandchildren, and perhaps our great-grandchildren, because we no longer speak their language, just doesn't sound like a great life to me at all. So how do we imagine right now that you leave today and you think about what you're going to do to get ahead? This is a reoccurring theme. It happens company by company. The PwCs and the Penguin books and these types of companies are saying actually what we do know is a fixed formal qualification does not bring any greater value to our organisations than someone without them. It's pretty confronting. But actually what we need to again understand, it's not saying that we don't appreciate what these values do, but actually the other skills are becoming more important. We tested this in New Zealand last year companies who were prepared to take away the need for a qualification for their jobs. Within a few weeks, we had 220 of our largest companies sign up and agree to take away the need for a qualification. These young people spend so much time with media here in Australia. We've got nearly five and a half hours a day of getting inputs from all over the world, tribes, people of different views, same views. They're constantly feeding their mind with new inputs. We have to make sure that we're getting inputs as well. Because I think this is a great analogy. If you imagine you sit in a pool of people who studied in similar areas as you, people who have similar age, maybe same gender, actually, where is the debate? Where is the ability to disagree? If you all have the same types of backgrounds, it's fundamental you find yourself a new stream of inputs. People who don't think like you, of a different age group, different gender, different ethnicity, totally different cognitive thinking. Because actually this is the only way you're going to drive yourself forward and be excited by technology, because you'll feel part of it. It's a great quote here, 
which I really want to know. It's, students, it's not about acquiring knowledge, but about how to learn. We're not just thinking about what to learn, but the ways we're learning now are so fundamentally different. We need to understand that, particularly if you're an educator. Nurture agility, focus on adaptability, and now think of reskilling. I just want to flick through a couple of options if you're looking at online learning. There are so many free platforms called MOOCs, Massive Online Open Courses. Udacity is one of them. Udemy is another one of them. Here's one called lynda.com. Very low cost or free programs for you to get ahead if you're the person who doesn't want to go back into a more formal education. And of course, I have to put one there for myself as well with a digital suitcase. So that there are ways of getting ahead and making this next period of your life incredibly exciting. Thank you so much.